The workplace can be tough. We are living in difficult times. A time when there are all types of radicals and pressure groups demanding they be heard and be approved by everybody else. Things can be especially tough for believers who desire a lifestyle that is true to their faith within the larger secular society that have long abandoned God and whatever he stands for. With the often toxic situation in many workplaces, how then is the Christian to witness seeing that his desire to fulfill the Great Commission may not only be unwelcomed but may even constitute breach of contract with potentially serious consequences for him. Our God is a good father and has left us enough instructions as to how to be gentle as a dove and be wise as a serpent as we navigate the landman field that the workplace has become. Obedience to this biblical instruction strengthens the believer, allows room for interaction with potential genuine seekers, even in hostile environments, and enhances his participation in the Great Commission just by doing his duty. And so, the title of this video is How to Live the Life of Faith in the Workplace. We want to listen attentively to the instructions the Lord has given to His people concerning the workplace. We shall look at only four of the specific character traits that will help the believer in Christ to be truthful to his faith at his place of work. Our instruction shall be from the book of uh, the Epistle to the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 22 to 25. And I read, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. Colossians 3, verses 22 to 25. A bit of background is in order. Colossians 3, verses 18 to chapter 4, verse 1, speaks of what you obtain within the believer's household. It speaks directly to each component of that home as composed in the first century. Here in this video, we are concerned with verses 22 to 25, which is the section that speaks to the slaves or servants in the household. Yes, this is directed at believers in Christ who are servants or slaves to believing and unbelieving masters. Yes, both believing masters and unbelieving masters are to be served alike. 
And so to our instructions, we look at Colossians 3.22 first. And I read, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God, as Colossians 3.22. A servant is someone who serves others. Although the word used in this verse could mean a servant or a slave. Someone who performs duties about the person or her home of a master or personal employer. The servant is someone completely controlled by someone or something. He is subservient to or controlled by the master. In the Greek Roman world, slaves were members of the household. And so here in this passage, we see that uh, servants are addressed directly as, are the, as they are the ones concerned. In those days, and as it happens today, wealthy families had servants. For example, we read of Boaz in Ruth 2, verse 5. The word servant is often used in scripture as a title for persons serving God. For example, Abraham is addressed to us in Genesis 18, verses 3 and 5. Moses is addressed as a servant of God in Numbers 11, 11. The disciples of Jesus Christ in the New Testament are also addressed as servants. Matthew 10, 24, also John 15, 20 as examples. Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. To obey is to follow the commands or guidance of someone to conform or to comply to what has been commanded. This is a severally repeated injunction to servants on the pages of Holy Scripture, and I've put a few examples here for reflection at your spare time. The servant is to follow commands or comply with instruction given to him by the master. All servants are to do what their position obligates them to do. Yes, they are to serve their masters and should do so. Their masters according to the flesh is another way of referring to their human masters. Whether such masters are or are not believers is irrelevant. As a believing servant or slave is to obey whomsoever they are serving. How are they to obey their masters? We are not left in doubt as to how. First, we are told of the negative, what, how they should not obey. Not with eye service as men pleasers. The service that is performed to make an impression in the owner's presence is referred to as eye service. That service is not done for its own sake, nor for the one's own conscience or to please God. Therefore, the motive is not fidelity to duty, but the desire to deceptively appear to be conscientious. Why the design is to avoid punishment. And so the Lord takes a dim view of eye service. Men pleasers also mean something similar. In this case, the desire is to appear to please the master while inwardly rebellious. Ordinarily, the servant will either do the duty shabbily or even abandon it altogether 
were it possible, especially if the master were not to be present. Men pleasers reckon only with men and their power. They therefore seek to please men to gain some favor or reward at the expense of some principle without taking God into account. Next, we are told how to actually obey, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. This is very important. Single-mindedly, that is without divided attention, whether the master was present or not, and whether there is reward or not. The conscientious will do the work with sincere heart and to the best of his ability, whether the master or supervisor was present or not, whether alone or in the company of others. And we may ask why? We are told, fearing God. Having a profound reference for God, especially for his authority and commands, is what is meant by fearing God. This fear of God, especially in relationship to the God of Israel, is also equated with the beginning of wisdom in Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10. Because the servant believes in and references God, not just for the fear of punishment from the master. In other words, the servant is a believer. But believers are commanded to obey as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Ephesians 6.6 6. To do no evil when no one sees or is watching is to fear God. Hence, this verse echoes what we are told elsewhere in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 to 6. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ, not with eye service, as men pleases but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Again, that's Ephesians 6, verses 5 to 6. And so this verse 22 speaks of submission. And submission is willful, delightsome sub uh, obedience that comes from the heart because of the realization that one is serving God and not man. This is very important. With this attitude, one so disposed is able to enjoy the duty and be a light in his environment because he is serving the Lord to the best of his ability. This person is looking beyond the human master that he is serving. In other words, in spite of Whatever are the shortcomings and ill treatment from the master, this person remains submitted. Not because the master is worth it, but because he sees beyond the master unto his Lord. Verse 23. And I read. Our Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not unto men. This is very, very important. It says that whatever, whatsoever, anything, everything, no matter what it is, but once you choose to do it, once you decide to do it, whatever job or duty it may be, once you accept to do it, then you do what you have accepted. Once you accept an employment, for example, you then fulfill the conditions of the contract. 
So it's the, the possibility is there of choice, suggesting you may reject to do whatever it is. But once you agree, then you have to do it. You do it heartily, that is, with your whole heart, with undivided attention, with desire and not grudgingly, or with grumbling. So you do it with your whole being and with gladness in your heart. Again, remember, these are the instructions of the Lord to his children. As, as to the Lord and not unto men. This is the crucial thing. As if you are serving God and not men. The only way you can walk with your whole heart, especially in a difficult environment, serving men or in an employment where you are not appreciated, is if your focus is the Lord and not man or a company. This is especially important since you spend considerable time at work compared to the other things you may engage in. You do remember your fellow human beings will often ill treat you in so many ways. You may be underremunerated, you may be underappreciated, and even be hated but you are still to see yourself as serving the Lord. And so, believers are commanded, whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 Again, for the believing servant, and as we go on, it will, be, it, it will be clearer why it should be so. The Lord should always be in focus. Again, this speaks of diligence. That's verse 23. That is, the servant is to pay thorough attention and care with no undue haste to whatever one does with the attainment of the best possible outcome as the end point. You want to do something and produce something of value, something that is eminently good. He is to do whatever he's doing with thoroughness, be conscientious in all undertakings. One could say again in another way, be industrious. The believer is to persevere and not to give up at the slightest difficulty or challenge. Verse 24, and I read, Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Colossians 3.24 in other words, they have the knowledge or they are acquainted in their hearts with this understanding that they are going to be rewarded. Not necessarily by the employer or by their master or by the Lord. This does, this does not mean one will not be remunerated, but you see reward beyond your pay packet, you know, the, 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 the perks you get from work, you see beyond that to the one who is really your master. You shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Again, the inheritance has been prepared for the believer in Christ from the foundation of the world. According to Matthew 24, 34, the, re the Lord will reward you as a believer in Christ, we are told you have been granted an inheritance with the saints. Again, I have put some verses there for you to, to look at and confirm this is the truth of the word of God. But in addition to that, 
the Lord also rewards you in the present life. For you serve the Lord. This is the core of the matter. The cross of the whole thing. You are serving the Lord in the work you are doing. Yes, in whatever thing you are engaged, you are serving the Lord. Not yourself, not your master, not your employer. Even though in the immediacy of your work, you are, you are evaluated by your human employers. But the ultimate evaluation, evaluator and rewarder is your Lord that others around may not be seen. And nobody serves the Lord in vain. That is very, very important for you to remember all the time. Your reward is not only in heaven, but even in this life, the Lord shows you with a diversity of blessings. And hence, the, the believer is to be with good will, doing service. As to the Lord and not to men. Ephesians 6, 7. Please understand that this is not suggesting that you should not take the normal remuneration and welfare packages available in the workplace into consideration. By all means, get as maximally remunerated as you can. But Whatever the remuneration and the environment may offer, once you are set to be there, then work to the best of your ability. That is what the Lord expects and commands. It is the Lord you are serving as you do your daily job, whether you class it as secular or religious, personal, business, Government or company work, they all involve serving fellow human beings. This verse 24 is speaking to us of excellence. That is to work in such a way as to produce something that is of outstanding quality or value. Our God offered his best to us in the person of his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. The Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ, offered his best for us, that is, his life on the cross. So we ought to offer God our best in all circumstances. When we love the Lord, we are only reciprocating his love for us. Verse 25. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Again, this is very, very important. But here is a caveat to the reward. It gives a motive for obeying the principle. The reward is conditional upon doing right according to the specifications of the Lord. Again, refer to verses 23 to 4 that we've just gone through. He that does wrong shall also receive the reward according to the wrong done. This is letting us know that just as good and conscientious work is rewarded, Wrongdoings also we receive appropriate reward. Yeah, I know you will say not reward but punishment, but the two are rewards. It's just that the consequences are different. And there is no respect of persons. Put another way, there is no partiality. The law does not respect personality or show partiality. Both the servant and the master 
will be accorded due reward or punishment according to what each has done irrespective of status. So you cannot say, oh, your master is an unbeliever and treat the work in a shoddy manner because God superintends everybody. The law will not reward you according to the right for the wrong you have done. You will not be given the reward for right doing if you have done wrong simply because you are a believer in Christ. This verse speaks to honesty. That is, this is straightforwardness of conduct. You are straightforward. Sincerity of purpose. No shady deals, no attempt to deceive. Whether alone or with others, the believer in Christ is to adhere to the truth. This is what is sometimes also referred to as integrity. When you are a person of integrity, it doesn't matter whether you are alone or with others. It doesn't matter whether people know you or they don't know you. You know and you do the truth only. That's integrity. You are not waiting for somebody to nudge you. You are not doing this because you are afraid. So we need to look at the basis of the unbelievers' work ethics. The tendency for slaves was to work well when the master washed, thereby easing their situations and perhaps qualifying them for some favors. Similarly, unbelievers are motivated by the need for recognition and praise from their masters in their attempts to gain human approval. They thus look for ways to impress for the purpose of gaining recognition and other benefits. However, oftentimes the expectations of the employees are usually beyond what the employer can or are willing to fulfill. The philosophy underpinning the work ethics of the unbeliever is that the end justifies the means. In other words, what they want, they believe they should attain by whatever means, irrespective of who is affected that is what that is saying. Since the unbelievers do not believe in God, their faith is in themselves. They tell you if you believe it enough, if you work hard enough, you can attain anything in your life. So, hence, many of them resort to various tricks and methods to get even with their employers and bosses when they feel they have been wronged. They don't mind slandering somebody Rendering evil reports so they can be promoted in place of that person. They develop crafty means of operation to attain whatever they are desiring, as they truly believe in their philosophy of the end justifies the means. Hence, they are willing to do, again repeating that, whatever it takes to achieve their goal. This may include dishonesty. It could include stealing, we include character assassination, even at times it can include murder. But the truth is, the end does not and should not justify the means. The unfortunate thing is that many believers come to the workplace with much theological baggage and they reason similarly to the unbelievers. Many forget that unlike the unbelievers, they have a master who is ever present wherever they happen to be. And many join the bandwagon of the unbelievers in their attitude to work. The status of the genuine believer in Christ is completely different from that of an unbeliever. Considering the seriousness of the damage 
being done to and by many believers in the workplace. It is necessary to look at some of the factors contributing to the unpleasant environment in the workplace of many believers. And so we look at this referred to as the elephant hidden in plain sight. Oh yes, that is the elephant in the room. And the elephant is hidden in plain sight. There is this widespread idea or attitude about work among certain sections of the Christian community. The idea that divides jobs into two broad groups or categories, namely secular work and God's work. So the saying goes that the so-called secular jobs as described have little to do with God. That's the thinking. And that's what makes the idea bad and dangerous. Though Christians may do these jobs, they do not have to be serious with them. Can you imagine that? Indeed, many of such jobs are said to be outrightly ungodly. So they may shun the so-called secular job with no adverse consequences from God. Indeed, many of them will even praise, feel they will be praised by God for not doing the so-called secular work or doing it shabbily. So goes the thinking. On the other hand, the so-called God's jobs are the real jobs because they are the ones approved by God. They are the ones that God is interested in. They are the ones that God has ordained. It is when you are doing this job that you are serving God. Can you imagine that? There are people who are convinced of this and they order their lives that way. The unfortunate thing is that it brings a lot of suffering to others and to themselves. The question may be asked, who defines these job categories? Of course, you should be able to guess, religious puppeteers, yes, who desire to profit from the ignorance or gullibility of the people. Yes, the for-profit gurus, you know, you do things the way they want, then you will have a tsunami of wealth. And the gullible follow them. And you may ask also, where do you find this, you know, God's jobs that are approved by God? Of course, you don't need to be a prophet to know. They are said to be found in churches and ministries. And lists as to which jobs are in the so-called secular jobs and God's works are ever in a state of flux as they are drawn up according to the whim and caprice of the religious gurus in church. And so goes the erroneous thinking based on erroneous theology. This error thunders from many pupils. Why the gullible filling the pews are giving thundering ovations to the puppeteers. This widespread but erroneous thinking that divides jobs into secular and God's work is the elephant hidden in plain sight. Yes, this is because though it has huge implications that are obvious. Not many see this as the major cause of the poor and often ungodly work ethics of many so-called Christians. And it also helps to feed the frenzy scrambling for miracles by many. Yes, it has serious implications for the workplace, especially where you have many with such conviction. Strange or unbelievable as it may sound, some of the fallouts from this erroneous theology begetting erroneous practice 
include but are not limited to this. Some will rather not do a so-called secular job while waiting for a so-called God's work. Some will not want to do a so-called secular job on a Sunday. Hence, a doctor, a nurse, or others on essential services will insist on not being roasted on Sunday, irrespective of the potential disruption and hardship that may result simply because they are Christians, and it is Sunday. Some, even after excusing themselves from walking on Sunday, will not even go to church on that Sunday. Yes, it goes on. Christians who work at so-called secular jobs on Sunday are often regarded as not committed to the Lord and possibly in a backsliding state. There are many church leaders who urge on this kind of error. In fact, there are many who will encourage you to leave your work so that you can come and join them in their ministry. They will be telling you God is calling you. Because of this error of thinking, some will feign sickness to be off work. After all, they say it is a secular job. God is not there. Then they will loiter around. Some will take sick leave only to go and walk elsewhere during the period of the sick leave. We're talking of believers here. And with no talk of conscience. While at the so-called secular job, this person does little work. As he spends much of the time in gossip and visiting social network platforms unrelated to the so-called secular job. Never mind that this is a job through which he is able to pay his bills. This person comforts himself with the thought that he is doing a secular job and is justified in his shoddy and ungodly work ethics because it is not God's work. And after all, they are not paying him very well. At the same time, he will be praying for promotion and elevation. Mark you, when it is, when it is so-called God's work, the work ethics does, it, does not change. It remains the same, if not worse. Many of them are sectarian and party spirit purveyors, leaving trails of conflict, strife and discord in their trail. They are adept at history and could tell you histories of many places and people with their own peculiar emendations. Some of them will insist that certain persons have been ordained to walk or worship in their own church or assembly, failing which God will be wrought if such ones should against such ones should they dare to disobey. Many have lost their jobs because of bad and ungodly work ethics that sprang from this faulty theology. Many have and many are still causing needless strife to others and suffering to those who dare attempt to call them to biblical work ethics. It is this unbiblical and godly thinking and many more that this passage of Holy Scripture addresses telling believers in Christ and indeed the world, the point of view of the Lord. As always, the word of the Lord is entirely relevant to his people today. Many find it difficult to explain why many so-called Christians are willing and indeed spend inordinate amount of time going from programs to programs. They run from one miracle service to another, from one fantastically anointed man of God to another. They hear one powerful message after another without seeming to be affected beyond the temporary excitement and transitory gratification of their insatiable appetite for the shallow but spectacular road shows. However, these and many more are all done in search of the elusive miracle that will flood them with unimaginable wealth 
without as much as lifting a finger. Banish all their enemies and problems into oblivion. Anoint them with the power to dominate any person and situation at the snap of the fingers. This they have been assured will happen simply because they are children of God who are supposed to be in dominion. And Christ has come to give them abundant life. I, this is just a small, or I should say a tip of the iceberg of the things that underlie a lot of the misbehavior of believers you see in the workplace. Many think that because they are in the so-called secular job, God is not there. In fact, many think that they have a right because they are believers to ill treat others who are non-believers. But the truth to be told, that is far from the word of God. And so we look at the basis, or should I say principles of the believer's work ethics. If that has not been clear so far, hopefully it will be clear from a summary of all we have been saying. The principle underpinning the work ethics of the people of God, both in the Old and the New Covenant, is whatever the believer does, he is doing for the all-seeing sovereign God. Yes, the Lord alone will reward everyone according to his doing without favoritism. Therefore, he is to, that is the believer, is to always do whatever he is doing as unto the Lord with all his ability. In every situation, in all circumstances, the believer's desire should always be to achieve the best result. From this principle, as a springhead flows all the details of the Christian work ethics. This is the principle underpinning the work ethics commanded believing slaves and servants in the first century. And indeed, it remains valid and applies to all, even till our day today. Hence, the believers in Christ should work conscientiously, as though, again, which is truly the truth, they are serving the Lord Christ in their places of work. This is important, especially as a final reward will come from the Lord when the believers appear before the throne of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 It is very, very important for us to recognize this. Wherever we are, we are never capable of being out of the sight of God. And so the truth be told, if you are a believer in Christ, you belong to God. The word there, dolos, is the Greek common Greek word for servant in the New Testament. In Greek culture, it most often referred to a slave. The slave served voluntarily and often permanently. But this slave's sin is far, far different from the experience of this transatlantic slave trade. Further, in Hebrew sense, yes, that's the aspect that has been applied to believers. Its Hebrew sense is used to designate a servant who willingly committed himself to serve a master he loved and respected. This one is willingly doing it, not by compulsion. Therefore, the New Testament believer is a willing 
committed servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he loves and obeys. Again, I've put in here several biblical references for you to reflect upon. In the New Testament, we find, as in the Old, servant is an honorable position and title for the people of God, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Being the servant or slave of Christ confirms the truth that the Lord has ransomed every one of the believers with his own blood. This is what scripture confirms. Ephesians 1, 7, Hebrews 9, 12, even 1 Peter 1, 19. And so it is very, very important for us that being a servant of the Lord has both temporal and eternal implications. Being a servant of the Lord is a lifelong status. For the Lord is both Savior and Lord. The believer in Christ is thus a servant who obeys his master out of love and respect from a heart of gratitude for what his master has done and we yet do for him. This relationship with Christ supersedes, transcends, yes, all other relationships the believer may have. Matthew 10, 37, Luke 14, 26. Due to the unmatchable superiority of this relationship, all other relationships are to be made subservient to it, as a loss who pretends every aspect of the believer's life. Hence, the true master, employer or boss of the genuine believer in Christ is the Lord himself. This is the whole thing that underpins the work ethics of the believer. That wherever you are, whatever you are doing, you are serving the Lord. And because the Lord is everywhere, the Lord is seeing you, even when your earthly master or employer is not seeing you. The earthly master or employer or boss is just another instrument. This you need to take to heart. Another instrument in the hands of the Lord to continue the ongoing work of sanctification of the believer by the Holy Spirit. Many people miss this because they want the environment to just be as they want. They don't want people to disagree with them. They want to be loved by everybody. But sometimes, have you come to understand or don't you realize, for example, this is just an example. If your problem is anger, don't be surprised that the law can make it that you are always exposed to situations that you, will make you angry. The unfortunate thing is you might think people don't like you. Rather than you doing what the Lord wants you to do, look into yourself as to why you get angry and then begin to deal with your anger issue. The Lord expects from the believer a behavior that affirms and honors the Lord all the time. Remember, God expects you in every situation to obey him over and above all excuses. And the question may then be asked, are you a believer in Christ, a true disciple? If you are, then you need to understand this. There is nothing like part-time Christianity. You are a full-time believer in Christ every second of your life irrespective of your status in life and at work. You are to have the Lord in focus in every situation, not because you cannot feel the impact of adverse circumstances, but because you know your true master is the Lord, and not the physical master employing you. 
wherever you are, the believer in Christ may be, whatever your earthly status may be, it might sound like a repetition to you, whatever work you may engage in, you remain the servant of the Lord. And the master's eyes are ever upon you, seeing not only what you are doing, but also your heart. The master is seeing not only you, the believer, but also all around you and what they are doing to and how they are impacting you. And do remember this basic truth. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it with us ever he will. Proverbs 21.1 1. In other words, whether you call the people you work with believers or unbelievers, God can touch their hearts. God can change them. God can use them in any number of ways he chooses. And so this is very important that you settle your relationship with the Lord. To some of you, this might sound insulting because perhaps you claim you have been a believer of several years. You might even be in a position of a leadership in the church. But please, I'm just appealing to you. Come down from your high horse and examine yourself. Understand this. Neither you nor your earthly employer is ever out of the sight of God. Your heavenly master is never absent, even if your earthly boss or employer is often absent where you are working. What you need to settle first is your relationship with the Lord. Ensure that you belong to God through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Yes, as we are told, as many as believe in him is the one that gives the power to become children of God. It is through him God adopts every believer. And so to, jog, to help jog your memory and to help, you know, in your reflection, he has a few questions. They are very personal that I encourage you to answer. Is the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth your Savior and Lord? Do you truly belong to him? Please don't consider that as, as an insult. Truly reflect. Do you endeavor to follow him like a disciple? Or you are just doing your own thing, your own way, thinking that somehow, by and by, the Lord will approve. Do you believe you carry the presence of the Lord in the person of the Holy Spirit? Again, this is assuming you are a believer in Christ, and that's a big assumption. Do you believe the Lord is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent? I presume you know the meaning of those things. Omnipresent, that is, is present everywhere. And that means nothing can be hidden from him. Omniscience means he can do anything. He has powers beyond your imagination. He can make things to happen. Remember again? Only God has the power to create. No so-called man of God, woman of God can call anything into existence. Only God has that power. So don't let anybody be lying to you, decreeing and declaring all sorts of lies to you. You will just sit down there and be receiving lies. Please, wise up. Omnipotent, yes, he has the power to do and undo. None of these three traits can are we capable of exhaustively understanding. Do you believe the Lord reigns sufferingly over all creation? 
He spoke everything into existence. And there is no division of believer or unbeliever as far as God is concerned. He can use the unbeliever. He can use inanimate things. Why? Because he created them for his own purpose. Do you believe the Lord has a plan for your life? And that plan is the best. Maybe you need to understand this. Your life is a drama. The script writer and the director is God. All the props and every other thing, people, situation that are part of the drama God has put in place. Does your lifestyle honor or dishonor your Lord? Are you struggling with any area of your faith in the Lord? Are you beginning to feel overwhelmed by your circumstances? Please, don't think this is impossible. It can happen. It is not unusual to have doubts at times. Only take your doubts to the Lord in prayer and in his word. Again, I encourage you and I plead with you, please do not pretend that everything is all right when it is not. Do not just answer yes to these questions in a hurry. Take time to ponder on these questions and many others that may come to your mind. Please, the answers have eternal consequences. It is time you look beyond your current circumstances and see the Lord in focus. Again, as if in repetition, to repeat, God is sovereign over all. The same Lord is overseeing the employer, the master, the boss, and the employee. Yes, if you are working somewhere, if you are working for yourself, it doesn't matter the circumstance. God is the one who superintends all of you. Whatever classifications or criteria you may use, the unquestionable truth of Holy Scripture is that the Lord is the sovereign ruler over all of creation. The person and circumstances God will use to bless you or to discipline you may not be known to you, but they are known to God because all answer to him. Remember the Balaam's donkey? When God commanded, it spoke with human language. We hear of God speaking and the sea parting. Please recognize the truth. God has all there is to be God. In fact, where the demons openly admitted to the power and rulership of Christ over them, they openly confessed who he was during his ministry. Understand this, even the devil obeys when God commands. Indeed, the devil cannot do all the evil he's capable of doing. And he cannot do all the evil he wants to do because of God's restraining order. The believer in Christ is not to walk only when the master, earthly master, that is his boss or employer, is watching, that's eye service, as men please us, according to verse 22. Rather, the believer understands the Lord, who is truly his master, is always watching, and that his work concerns his Lord. That's what we're told in verses 23 and 24. 
Again, this is echoed severally in Holy Scripture. I have put a few verses here. It's, the list is not exhaustive, but please take time to go through them. Because these things need not only to be in your head, they need to be in your heart where they can then be operative. Where you can begin to see how you are responsible in some ways for the, some of the circumstances in the workplace. The believer should hold to the Lord's promise that he will ensure that the believer will receive a just eternal compensation for his works. Yes, this is very, very important. Because God deals with obedience and disobedience impartially. Yes, we need to understand that. This is one of the things people don't think about. That you are important. Yes, you are important to the Lord. And so you should use, you know, the work you are doing may be trivial. You know, it may be minor. You, you might look at it as unimportant. People might look at it as not very important. But you that you are doing the work, you are not trivial, you are not unimportant. Rather, you are important to the Lord. And because you are important to the Lord, and you are serving Him at that work, please use the job as an opportunity for an act of worship. How do you do that? You do it conscientiously. You do it heartily with joy, with rejoicing. Yes. Please understand, these qualities of submission, diligence, excellence, honesty, are some of the character traits the Lord demands of all his followers in all circumstances. Crucially, it's important that you understand that this attitude and the character traits can either be motivated by earthly reward. In other words, they are not things you can sum up because of anticipated gain. You know, maybe, oh, they are going to promote you or they are going to give you more money. Nor can it be distracted if there is no re prospect of earthly reward. In other words, even if there is no evidence, there is no possibility of you getting rewarded, this, this will not still prevent these traits from being in a person who is a believer. So you cannot rely only on yourself for the acquisition and development. But the Lord requires them in all his people. He has therefore given the Holy Spirit to indwell you. With the help of the Holy Spirit, every believer in Christ is given the needed grace to achieve this level of work as he walks as unto the Lord in all situations. These are some of the things that the unbelievers lack. And when they see in you, we enhance your testimony as you witness for the Lord by your lifestyle in the workplace. The Master in heaven will reward you, for it is the Lord you are serving, even at that job. Please understand, there is no excuse not to excel in the workplace. The servants are directly addressed here as the ones concerned and not their masters or employers. Yes, it is possible the servants, you know, serving another human being might think he is not responsible for anything. They are by putting 
the responsibility and blame upon his master or employer. And so you commonly hear people absorbing themselves, you know, of their shoddy behavior and work ethics. You hear things like, well, they are poorly paid. Oh, well, they are ill-treated. Oh, well, you know, the money is not even enough to pay the bills. They start giving all sorts of excuses, all in an attempt to push the blame elsewhere. But from what you have been hearing, what you have been watching, you will know that you at work has responsibilities. And so, that is to let you understand that you should have no doubt. So, you are told in clear terms in this passage that the servant, you, is responsible for certain things for which you are accountable for. No matter how you are treated at work, there's still certain level of behavior and that God demands from you and holds you accountable for. So as for such things, you cannot lay the blame elsewhere. Remember that every believer in Christ is irrespective of his status, a servant of Christ, working for his master, the Lord Jesus Christ, in various spheres of life, under various human bosses. 1 Timothy 6, 1-3 And I read it, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters, worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. You see that again. It's about God, not about you, not about your employer. And if you are a true child of God, the glory and the honor of God will be paramount in whatever you do. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. I pray the Lord will give you that believing heart, that desire to see beyond your current circumstances and see the Lord on the throne. It is very, very important. Again, there is no excuse acceptable for short service. For dishonest service. That is not to say people will not attempt to give a re reasons. Yes, I'm aware. You can come up with many reasons why the servant should not obey the master in all things. You may come up with many reasons why the believer work should not give, a believer at work should not give his best in an unbelieving work environment especially when such a believer is being ill-treated. They will all, if from our human reasoning, which is at best flawed, yes, whatever excuses, whatever reasons we are trying to give, they are from human reasoning and they are flawed. Yes, you may argue adducing reasonable and plausible reasons as to why this instruction may not be true or should not be true for every situation, especially in the 21st century. But I can assure you this. All such will be futile attempts to find a loophole for our intended disobedience where there is none. Understand this. The Lord who commands expects to be obeyed. He knows 
that humans, even at their best, can be utterly wicked. So our wisdom is to trust the Lord and obey. Where we feel afraid, weak, not up to, yes, not up to it, overwhelmed. That I, you look at it and you say, oh, you are feeling not up to it. Yes, you seem not to have the strength. You seem not to have the will to go on. The thing seems to be gradually becoming overwhelming. Yes, there can be circumstances or situations like that. What you are to do is to turn to him who has the strength of the unbreakable. And he will pour more grace. Yes, he will pour more grace upon you that you might successfully obey him to your blessing and to his glory. Remember again, it's all about his glory. This is just a reminder again In the workplace, let your lifestyle be that of submission, diligence, excellence, honesty. With your focus on your ultimate employer, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, you are commanded to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5.16 And so, if in the workplace you are behaving like the unbeliever, your light is not shining. No. Rather, it is dimmed, and evil may have already gone out. I pray that will not be your portion. Challenges should fuel the fire of your faith rather than quench it. But if you your focus is on your employer and how to get even most of the time, you will likely be unhappy, grumpy, and frustrated and be a caricature of what you should be as an ambassador of Christ in the workplace. Please endeavor always to be what your Lord expects you to be in the workplace. That is, you are to be the oasis of excellence and decorum amidst the corruption and strife that may be taking place in your place of work. Remember again, the ultimate employer of the believer in Christ is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You should therefore work for him with all your heart, for from the Lord will surely come your reward. And I pray may the Lord ease any unpleasant circumstances at your place of work. May he touch the hearts of everyone at the place of work, creating a conducive atmosphere for your light to shine. May you be a blessing to your fellow workers with your life honoring the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Please understand all that have been said presupposes that you watching this video, you are a believer in Christ. If you are not yet a believer in Christ, then this is not yet for you. For here, only believers in Christ are addressed. They are the ones who are the slaves, who are the servants of Christ. They are the ones Christ has ransomed from the slave market of sin, which is precious life. But then, 
you can become born again. You can be ushered into the family of God. Because God knew you existed, but he, there are certain things you need to understand first. The Creator has assessed all human beings and have come to the conclusion that all have sinned. Romans 2, 3, 23 and come short of his glory. And the wages of sin, according to his just decree, is that death is the wages for sin. Romans 6, 23. You cannot save yourself. You are not capable of giving anything, no matter what you think. Just like you, are, you, are, you don't have a neck, long enough to see tomorrow. You don't have any means to purchase your own ransom. So you cannot save yourself. God still loves to save you. And he has made provision. And he says, confess and believe. You confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus Christ has come into the world in the flesh has died for our sins and have saved us. So he has paid the penalty for your sins. He is whosoever shall come, as many as will come. So in the invitation is open to all. The Lord Jesus Christ is now calling you. Yes, he's calling. Hear his call. And I pray you heed the call. Yes, the Lord's call now. Hear. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and lean of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11, 28-30 What are you waiting for? Please delay no longer. Arise now and call upon the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. And as you do this, I pray that may the Lord accept you into his kingdom as you appropriate the finished sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.